I'm going to give the report for uh, of the 133rd uh, Bible Fellowship Church Annual Conference. The theme of this year's conference was pressing on. We tend to look at things as individuals, but we're challenged as a group of churches to press on towards the goal of reaching the lost for Christ. The first speaker, Pastor Richard Taylor, the former senior pastor at Grace BFC in Wallingford, PA, said that we often see the word you as singular when in fact it can be taken in the plural form. Uh, like they say down south, you all. When Aiken took the plunder from Jericho against God's command, God said that the whole of Israel disobeyed him just due to one person's sin. When one person is hurting, we all hurt. When one congregation is weak, the whole Bible Fellowship Church is weakened. When churches close, the whole denomination is weakened. When new churches are planted, then we are strengthened and God is glorified. So how are we in our own particular church here? What are we doing to strengthen the whole body of Christ? Are we witnessing? Are we evangelizing? Are we making Jesus known to our neighbors, not just by words, but by thoughts and actions? Over 200 pastors, elders, missionaries, church officials, and lay people prayed for our church mightily during this whole conference. There are many people within the denomination that are concerned for our welfare as a church and are offering to help us in various ways. They do not want to see us close, but rather to grow and thrive. We cannot look inward to our own little congregation, but rather outward to the denomination as a whole and to the world without Christ. We must fulfill Christ's commission to reach everyone with the gospel, starting in Wissanomi and all the other surrounding communities. All of this is not possible without us going to the Lord in prayer each day, every day. For God created us to bring him praise and glory. We cannot grow this church on our own strength or in our own mindset. We must preach Jesus in season and out of season. We must not fear what others may think of us for Jesus' sake. Perfect love casts out fear. Let us unite with renewed determination not to let the enemy have control over this neighborhood when it belongs to the Lord and Savior, even as few as we are. Jesus can make things happen. And if I could call my wife to, if it would be all right, uh, Elder Bud, would it be all right? Kathy, could you come up front? We went to the same meeting, but we got two different things. And um, I think that always happens when you have um, two people because you come at it from two different viewpoints of what's going on in your life. So, as he said, the theme for this year was pressing on. 
and I got four things that we were to press on for it. And they explained pressing on isn't like um, pushing, but rather not giving up, not letting um, circumstances cloud your mind with what's going on, but keeping your mind just on focus. And um, the one thing was building up the body of Christ and we welcomed in a new uh, church, a new particular church in the denomination. And they kept saying, the Mission Mission Church. And I kept saying, why do they say mission? The name of the church is The Mission. Mm -hmm. And it was a mission church. So they called it the Mission Mission Church, but now mm -hmm. it's just the Mission Church. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a great thing to see these people come. Their um, uh, worship team came up and led us in worship afterwards, and it was just wonderful. Um, we're to press on in prayer, and prayer was the major focus that I got out of this week. I don't think I've ever prayed so much in my entire life. Everything was just covered in prayer, every, every move, every thought, every um, decision they made, everything was covered in prayer. And um, the one morning, the moderator said, I want you to uh, pray only prayers of worship. And if you ask for something, there's going to be a little trap door underneath you, and you're going to fall through the floor and never be seen again. All you, could, you couldn't ask for anything. You couldn't ask for someone to be healed or um, anything like that. You only could praise God. And just to hear these hundreds of voices praising God all around the room was so awesome. I can't even explain it. And we press on with both in our ministry with the ordination of five men. And they mentioned that in the last four years, 34 men have been ordained. Um, that surprised me. I didn't think that there were that many, but it's not uh, a dying denomination by any means. And we pressed on with thriving to be, that's, I'm sorry, striving. I left the S off there. We pressed on with striving to be fully committed to our calling. Living for Christ is not just a do it if you feel like it kind of thing. And the thing that impressed me most was how much love was shown to this congregation. Um, I said to one of the ladies, we have felt alone so long here with no pastor and being so small in number. And she gave me a big hug and said, you're not alone, honey. You have all these people here. And there are thousands of people praying for us. And I said that literally there are thousands of people praying for us. And God hears the prayers of his people. And um, they all told me, don't give up. God's not done with your congregation. God's not done with your particular church. There's something coming. And I believe it. I believe that something is coming. Um, and the thing they kept uh, emphasizing was we're autonomous churches, but we're not independent. We have the Bible Fellowship behind us. So when we feel all alone, we're really not. And I do thank you for allowing me to attend because it really was a life-changing week for me. Okay, the name of our message for this morning is Mystery Revealed, and our text is Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 to chapter 2, verse 5. My father was teaching me how to play baseball. And of course, my twin brother, too. But my twin brother was a natural athlete. They shouldn't have named him John. They should have named him Jock. <laughs> uh, he could run fast. He could jump over walls, pull himself up. Uh, you wanted him to be on your uh, half-east team. Uh, 
He couldn't outdo me in shape, however, which uh, was a, a piece of pride for me. <laughs> but he certainly was better at baseball. Um, so we're at the rec center uh, right off of Wyoming Avenue, right behind the library. <clears throat> and uh, one guy's pitching, and I'm swinging at air. You know, I'm trying to get that big swing, you know, to hit it out of the rec. Maybe even break a window with this mm -hmm. one. That, the neighbors don't like that, but the guy said. And I couldn't, I couldn't even meet the ball. And my father says to me, Joe, instead of trying to make the big home run, just take the bat and meet the ball as it's pitched. Okay, we'll start there. I was hitting shots all over the infield. And then I learned, if I twisted my body a certain way, instead of hitting it right to the shortstop, I got that nice gap between the first and second baseman. And I wasn't the greatest runner, but I could make it to first base. And my, my father and my brothers, you know, said, way to go. And it's good to be encouraged, isn't it? Um, every time Dorothea makes a wonderful meal, um, any time my good friends Rusty and Debbie when I see them, I'm encouraged. And of course, Carol, for everything she does for us, I'm terribly encouraged. Uh, Kathy, every time you walk through the door, I'm encouraged to see you. And of course, Bud and his wife, Karen, they definitely encourage us. And most of all, my wife <coughs> encourages me to, in my uh, work here, I couldn't do what I do without her. It's good to be encouraged. And don't we all like people who encourage us? Sometimes that little bit of encouragement is all it takes to get us moving. And once we get moving, things get accomplished. As we continue our series through Colossians, we're hitting a section where Paul plays the encourager. If you've been with us so far, you know some of the background of the church of Colossae. They were a young church, and they're feeling the pressure. There's pressure from the outside, Society is wanting to press the Colossian church into conformity, into compromising. There's pressure from within the church. Some of those within the church are coming up with all these different rules and special knowledge, you know, that they have. And ha ha, I have it, you don't. If you need to get it. You're, you're going to have to hang out with me, and maybe, just maybe, some of it will rub off on you. And those who are in the middle, trying to stay the course that Jesus laid out for them, they're being pulled in every direction. It's a young church. They you don't quite know where to go. 
We know how it feels when you're in the middle of a tug of war. You wear out quickly. Sometimes you just want to quit Be, and wait until all the pressure stops and all the nonsense flows over and you walk back into a peaceful, nice situation. So, with this background, Paul steps up for a few paragraphs of encouragement. He wants to encourage the church to stay the course. He wants to let them know there's good that's still yet to come. We live in a world a lot like the world the Colossians were in. And we feel the same pressures they did. Society wants us to conform. Guys can marry other guys. Girls can marry other girls. A guy who says he feels like a woman should use the woman's room. A woman that feels like the guy, she should be able to use the guy's room. I'd like to see how they use the urinal to stand up. We'll know how that's going to work out for them. But society wants us to compromise. And the church today, as a whole, it's fractured. Denominations all hold to, we got the right stuff. They're a little bit off over here. They're a little bit off over there. But us, we, we got it right. And it's easy to get discouraged in a backdrop of all this. It's easy to say, I just don't think it's worth it. I'm going to sleep in every Sunday. I'm not going to walk around and talk about Jesus with my friends and the people I run into. I'm not going to tell them that they can be saved from their sins by having faith in Jesus and his death and resurrection. It's just easy just to go about our own little way and do our own little thing. And after all, we have ours, right? We have our salvation. Hey, I got mine. Good luck with you. Good luck to you. I hope you make it. So we needed this word of encouragement as much as the Colossian church did. Let's see how Paul encourages the Colossian church. And let's see if we get some encouragement out of it as well. Facing a world of change, remember, the legacy of the church's struggle. Look at verse 24. I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body, the church. Now, I want to talk uh, real briefly about the difference that uh, Paul is talking about here. There are two types of suffering. The type of suffering that Paul's going through and that Jesus went through throughout his life, it's what we call missional, missional suffering. In other words, we're suffering because we're carrying out the mission God has given us. Whereas the suffering Christ went through when he was arrested till the time that he ultimately died on the cross, that was 
suffering that was sacrificial. In other words, when he died on that cross, his sacrament, he was the sacrifice for our sins. So there's a difference there. I want you to know that. Paul struggled to support the church. It cost him. He suffered. Most of Paul's ministry was opposed by almost everyone. He was always fighting an uphill battle. He was writing to Col the Colossian church from prison. But his struggles and sufferings paled in comparison to the importance of what he had to say. He wanted the Colossian church to remember that. Going against the grain is a struggle. Most people will fight against you. They crucify Jesus. Why think it might be different for us? Christ suffered and died. If they killed Jesus, what are they going to do to us? But what the Colossian church was doing was important. It was extremely important. If it wasn't important, there wouldn't be any resistance. They must have been making a difference because it was stirring up trouble. Just like everything we have gone through. Pastor Justin being here and, you know, we really didn't have the money to uh, support him. That was a struggle. Elder Kara, him leading the church. That was a struggle for the members here. Satan almost put us out of business. And we're no we're near healthy. congregation, the uh, membership, the amount of people coming out is down. The amount of money coming in is down. Our expenses, we've cut them to the bare bones. But we're here in this community for a reason. And we're in our own communities for a reason. We are to preach the word of God to every nation, kingdom, tribe, and tongue until Jesus comes back. In this neighborhood, it's bang, bang, shoot them up near the park. Uh, Crystal's not here, um, but she was in her apartment when she lived over here. And uh, a guy was in her apartment with her. Somebody shot right through the door and killed him right in front of Crystal. Could have been Crystal instead of him. There are drug deals going on. There's prostitution going on. Uh, I've cleaned up uh, drug bags and condoms out of the little uh, uh, stairwell that goes to this to the basement. 
and it's not the first time um, the neighbors are now upset because we put up do not park signs it's a struggle and the outside world has their view on what we should do and if we don't do what they want us to do oh you're not Christian well most of them their names don't begin with G and if it does it's not God and if it begins with a J it, it's not Jesus and if it's Jesus, that might translate into Jesus, but they're not the Messiah. So we shouldn't worry about all that. But we should tell the truth to them in love. We should treat them with love and kindness. And believe you me, I... A lot of times don't want to go that way. But it's the way Jesus wants us to go. And I have difficulty a lot of times, a lot of difficulty. Uh, I say that to my shame. I encourage you if uh, that anger rises up against you, uh, rises within you. The Holy Spirit lives within you. Just stop, take a breath, and pray. It doesn't have to be a long time of prayer, because it's really prayer. Prayer is a conversation with God who we know loves us. So whenever we feel that way, let us turn to him and let us remember how he would have us walk. There's many voices in society that are trying to shout over us. Sometimes it seems we're making no progress at all. And we're making no difference in this world. But remember what we're about. We're about seeing people change by the power of God. We're about seeing our families united and strong. We're about seeing our world turn to the love and grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. Everything else pales in comparison. Baseball pales in comparison. That's a hard thing for me to say. Hockey pales in comparison. All the goodies you can buy on Amazon or in Target or in Walmart, they pale in comparison. A wonderful car or truck, anything you can own, Remember, you can't take it with you. The only thing you can take with you is what Jesus has had you do. Jesus has invested in all of us. Remember uh, the story of the ruler who uh, gave money to three servants. <clears throat> God wants us to invest 
in his kingdom using the talents and the material things he has given us to invest that in his kingdom. And we're to go out and hold on and conquer until he comes. It's a struggle, but it's worth it. It was worth it when Jesus saved us. It was worth it when he was nailed to the cross. And it's worth it when we see those we love come to know our Lord and Savior as their Lord and Savior. What propels the church is encouragement and unity. Paul knew all the Colossian church faced. Look at chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and for the church and land to see it. For many other believers who have never met me personally, I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. He said his purpose is to encourage their hearts. He wants his encouragement to lead to love and unity. The Colossian church needed to be reminded of their, that their mission was important. They needed to be encouraged to stand strong for Jesus. It would have been easy to roll over and, get up, and give up. Everything looked to be stacked against them. Look at us. Very little money, a handful of people, no pastor. It doesn't look good, sports fans, right? But we are not alone. Jesus has given us his resurrection power by the pouring out of his Holy Spirit within each one of us. And Jesus is going to do the work. This is going to be Jesus' church. And if we're tuned in to what he wants us to do, and if we're willing to do what he wants us to do, remember, he's Lord. If he's Lord, then you're a servant. The word servant that you find so often in Paul's letters means a bond slave without any rights. In other words, you were bought and you don't have any rights except to do what your Lord wants you to do. It, as the elders of the, this church, I can say with confidence, it's not the Joe and Bud show. It's not the deacons and deaconesses show. As a matter of fact, a lot of the work that's done in this church is done by people who are not even members of this church. Or by people who don't have titles.
And just remember the title, Elder to Bud Nye, and I think I could talk uh, in Bud's name about this. Um, it's not, I'm Elder Joe Speck. I'm Elder Bud Burroughs. No, that's a title. Just like I was a laborer and I dug ditches for years and years. The title elder means that I have responsibilities. I'm primarily a teaching elder. Bud's primarily a ruling elder. What's that mean? He takes care of the books and he has an eye on uh, the financial end and the worship end. Joe's preaching today because this is Joe's part. That's the responsibility I've been given. But it's a job. It's not. Uh, uh, you know, it's not something that I strut around with. Paul encouraged them to be united. It was hard enough being a church in a society that opposed them. How much harder is it when you're opposed by those who are supposed to be on your side? You can't fight the enemy if you're fighting each other. Paul was about to call out those who were disrupting the unity of the church. To be effective for Jesus, they had to be united in mind and purpose. They had to be united in love. Most of what the world sees of the church is disunity. We have a lot of that up till recently. And praise our Lord God that for the most part, that has dissipated here. We're a small group, but we love each other. And we want to take care of each other. Even if all we can do is just pray 